Well, we spent the last, well, last seven weeks of gathering together and studying outside of a one-off during Christmas, uh, looking at different prayers of the Apostle Paul in his letters to the churches. What were the things that Paul was praying for these churches and looking at them, studying them, understanding how those are things that we ought to emulate. Those are also things that we ought to be praying about. And hopefully we've seen that Paul himself is passionate about his prayer, that his prayers are full of passion and sincerity and care and concern. This is not something that Paul approaches lightly or considers lightly, but that he considers it incredibly important. And we would say that Paul clearly believes that prayer makes a difference in the lives of those for whom he prays. And so it's natural that not only does Paul, because he believes that prayer is powerful, practice praying regularly and passionately for other people, but Paul himself also seeks the prayers of others because he recognizes that prayer is important and prayer is powerful. And so not only does he pray for others, but he asks that they would pray passionately for him. He doesn't go around simply saying, well, I'm an apostle, so I don't need prayer. But instead, he urges, he exhorts, he appeals to these churches that they would pray for him, for his ministry. And so as we close our series on the prayers of Paul, we're going to turn to not a prayer that Paul offers, but a prayer that Paul asks for. That throughout this series, we've looked at his prayers on behalf of others, but now we see the prayer that Paul asks the Roman church to pray for him. So open with me to Romans chapter 15, in verse, starting in verse 30. Romans 15, starting in verse 30. Here at the end of his letter to the church at Rome, what a beautiful, wonderful letter. We could spend years studying the depth of the riches of the theology and the doctrine and the practices and the promises that Paul writes about in this letter. Uh, and maybe we'll do that one day. But for now, we're just going to look at these four verses right at the end of chapter 15. And Paul says to the Roman church, he says, I appeal, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. It's a very simple, short prayer, and I think it teaches us a few things that we can understand about the struggle of prayer, the things that we work for in prayer. First, I want to see, like, look at Paul's language in this request. He says, as it's translated in the ESV, I appeal to you, brothers. Uh, the NIV, the New International Version, and the LSB, the Legacy Standard Version, they translate that word appeal as, I urge you. Brothers, or you could even translate it in the Greek to I exhort you, brothers. This isn't a small, like, hey, you know, if you have a chance, possibly if you don't mind, uh, would you pray these things for me? You know, Paul is like, I exhort you, I appeal, I am begging you, Romans, to pray these things for me. And not only does he have this strong language in his appeal, his desire, his urging, his exhortation, for these prayers, but his description of prayer is incredibly strong. That he doesn't want them to be just dispassionate, sort of neutral, kind of wishy-washy in these prayers. No, he desires it greatly, and he asks them to go into this prayer very strong, vehemently, that they are going to pray for him, and we ought to pray for others that we want to do this wholeheartedly, whole selfedly, that all of us is engaged in this act of intercessory prayer, of prayer on behalf of others, because it is serious matters that we are going into, and it is serious things that we face in this life, that prayer should not be entered into half-heartedly, but it should be entered in fully. And so for point number one, Put it down this way, we need to struggle alongside others in prayer. We need to struggle alongside others in prayer. 
The Greek word that's translated strive together is the word sunagonizomai. Uh, and I hope you hear in the middle of that agonizomai, that agony, that that idea of agony that we can hear in our English word agony is right there in the middle of this word. And the whole idea, the translation of the word, it has this idea of fighting alongside or contending with that we are fighting with, we are struggling with, that Paul is almost picturing this as like an athletic endeavor where it's a tag team wrestling match and it's Paul and the Roman church in this match together, that they are fighting side by side, or this is a court case going before a judge and that they are this team of lawyers working together, that it is not a lone ranger, but they are advocating alongside one another. And so when we think about our prayers on behalf of others, let us never consider this as something that is just simple, that it is light-hearted. Like, no, this is an opportunity for us to go to battle on the behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ. That when we are interceding, when we are going before God's throne on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are taking up arms against the powers and principalities at work in this world on behalf of those for whom we are praying that we are entering into the eternal spiritual conflict between good and evil, between Satan and the flesh and the world that is rebelling against God. We are going in to that conflict on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is something that is weighty and significant. Paul clearly believes that prayer makes a difference. And so he prays vehemently for his brothers and sisters. But he asks, he urges, he begs that others would do the same for him. Paul, in his ministry in Asia, which was a Roman province, western Turkey today, he faced significant persecution. He faced a lot of opposition to the ministry and the message of the gospel. Uh, throughout Paul's missionary journeys, you see and read throughout the book of Acts all the persecution and challenges and hardships that Paul faced for the sake of the gospel. And so he describes that, and he describes how he was brought through that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. He writes to the Corinthian church, he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. Right there, we see so clearly, so beautifully that Paul's trust his security, his faith is on the God who raises the dead. He is certain, he is confident, he is able to persevere in his fight for the gospel because of his trust in God. But he goes on in verse 11, he says, we're continuing on uh, after he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Yes, Paul trusted God. We must trust God in our struggles against the sin in our lives, against temptation, against the flesh, against the world, our struggles against the trials and tribulations that we face, the difficulties and hardships that come our way. We must trust in God ultimately. But let us not approach it as lone rangers with just us relying upon God, but let us utilize the community of the church for our deliverance. Let us trust also, let us be encouraged by the prayers of others on our behalf. Paul says right there, he goes from, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer. Paul is confident and trusting that God will deliver him in his ministry for the sake of the gospel. Paul is also immediately asking for 
the prayer of his brothers and sisters in Christ at the church in Corinth. And in the same way as he is planning to go back to Jerusalem, as he is writing this letter to the Roman church, he is collected from the churches in Macedonia a, an offering to give to the poor church in Jerusalem, to encourage them, to bless them financially. And so he is bringing this gift back to Jerusalem, a place that has been a hotbed of persecution for the church from the very beginning. And so he asks and says he desires and he urges and he begs for their prayers for his deliverance from the unbelievers. And so first and foremost, we want to seek others to struggle in prayer for you. We want to follow the example of the Apostle Paul. If it was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for us. If Paul felt the need to ask for believers to pray for him, and these Romans, they had never met Paul. Paul had never been to Rome yet when he wrote this letter to them. That we have the benefit and the blessing of not only people whom we have never met, but we have the joy and the honor and the privilege of being in a community here and rooted, a community here at Compass, to ask for, to seek, to reach out to other believers for prayer. It's, one of, it's been my favorite thing that I've seen with the band app that we have for this ministry is just the regular requests for prayer that we are reaching out and asking for and seeking prayer from our brothers and sisters in Christ through the wonders and the magic of technology, that we don't need to write a letter and seal it up and send it off in the mail and hope that it arrives eventually at some point in time down the road so that others can be made aware of our request, but we can pull up our phone, send a text out, and within a few seconds, everyone can know the needs and concerns that we have, that we are seeking prayer for. So let us continue in that regard. Let us also pursue that in fellowship outside of Wednesday nights or during Wednesday nights. But when we are hanging out, when we are gathering together, whether it be as a group or just individually going out for coffee, grabbing a meal, spending time with one another, hitting the slopes and skiing and snowboarding, whatever we're doing to spend time with one another, utilize those as opportunities and times to ask and seek prayer from others. Use that time on the chairlift where you are waiting and trying not to freeze as the wind gets you just right as an opportunity for you to share, hey, would you be praying for me with this? Would you be praying for me as I seek to share the gospel with my coworker? As I struggle with unbelieving family members, as I seek to be sanctified in this area of sin. Encourage one another, build each other up. Utilize those times of spending time with one another to seek prayer from others. It's one of the things that I think is so important and so beautiful about the Partners Program. If you've not had an opportunity to go through it, it's our one-on-one -on -one discipleship program that our church does. Um, if you would like to go through that, come talk to Kate or I after we are done here. We'd love to talk with you about it, what it is all about, uh, connect you with a leader. If you've gone through it already and would like to start taking people through, go ahead and start talk to Kate and I about that as well. But that is a wonderful time to study the Word of God, to study the character of God, to study what it means to be a Christian, to live the Christian life. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to open up, to be vulnerable, to share the prayers, the concerns, the needs that we have, and to invite someone into our life and to ask them, to urge them, to appeal to them to struggle on our behalf in prayer. If you guys have roommates that are believers, they are a wonderful tool to utilize. Uh, that was one of the most encouraging things. I still have guys that I lived with, that I did a lot of, spent a lot of time with in college, hanging out, going to Perkins at 11.30 in the evening to eat breakfast potatoes and talk theology that I will still reach out to for prayer requests. That now, over a decade after I graduated college, they are some of the people I will immediately reach out to when the need arises. And they are people that I trust are going to struggle on my behalf in prayer, that they are going to strive with me for these things in prayer. We need to cultivate a strong team to fight alongside us against the challenges of the world. 
It is promised to us. Uh, in 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul writes, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That is all. To use an easier phrase from the Greek, that word that's translated all means all. Um, it means every. It means every single person, every believer who desires to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. They will face trouble and hardship in this world as they seek to live a godly life, as they seek to obey the word of God. So who is going to struggle with you when you face sin and temptation, when you are battling the temptations of this world, the temptations of the flesh? Are you going into that fight alone or are you inviting others into that battle? Are you allowing others to bear that burden with you. That is what we are called to do in Galatians. Paul writes that that is how we fulfill the law of Christ, is by bearing one another's burdens. And the context of that makes it clear. He is talking about sin and temptation. So bring others into your fight against sin, that they might contend with you against temptation. When you are facing hardship, whether that be a simple hardship caused by things of this world, difficulties with work or with family or with coworkers or with friends or just with the natural circumstances of this life, who is struggling with you on your behalf before God? Who has your back? My roommate in college, Jamie, he always had my back in pickup basketball. He knew if I got a fast break, and I'm going for the layup, like a foot and a half inside of the, the free throw line, stand there, be ready for the terribly bricked layup, get the rebound, and score the basket. It was a perfect two-man game. He always had my back. In a more athletic demonstration of it, I think of the Fiji Sevens rugby team, and they call it Fiji Magic, uh, and they will run into contact, these big old Fijian men, will run into contact, they suck in two defenders, and they just throw the ball up in the air. And it looks like pure insanity, except when they are on, every time without fail, there's another guy hitting the gap, catching the ball, and sprinting on. And it is this beautiful picture of seven guys working together as one, sucking in the defenders, throwing no-look passes behind the back, over the head. It looks like utter insanity, except it works to perfection. And when other teams try it, they don't have the sync, they don't have the magic, they don't have the rhythm, and it is atrociously bad. But when it is done right, when you have that perfect support, hitting the gap every single time, always there, always filling that gap, it is a beautiful thing to behold. And in the same way, in the Christian life, when we constantly have brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling on our behalf, who are there ready to go before God on our behalf when we are struggling, when we are facing challenges, when we are being beset by temptation, it is a beautiful and a wonderful thing to behold. And so be the initiator in this. Reach out. Ask for help from others. Bring others into those dark places of sin and temptation and struggle. And allow the light of Christ to shine in there. And allow your brother or your sister to go before God on your behalf. To fight alongside you against sin, against temptation. Stop fighting these things alone in the dark. Ask for help. Open up. Be vulnerable. Lay yourself out there and find the joy of the forgiveness that is there in Christ Jesus and the joy of having someone to fight alongside of you, to encourage you, to build you up. I think of Sam Wise Gamgee, who is one of the greatest characters in all of literary history from Lord of the Rings. And I think of the journey up Mount Doom, when Sam could no longer bear the burden of the ring for Frodo, and Frodo could go no further for the burden of the ring was too great as they reached Mount Doom. And yet Sam said, Mr. Frodo, I can't carry the burden for you, but I can carry you. 
And Sam picks up Frodo and carries him up the mountain. It is one of the most beautiful pictures of what we are seeking here in the Christian life. Uh, it is one of the best ways to think about this opportunity that we may not be able to specifically pick up that burden of sin that someone is facing and struggling with. Ultimately, we each must put to death the sins in our own lives. But our brothers and sisters in Christ can carry us while we are weak. They can bring us before God. They can encourage us and build, in, build us up and strengthen us and point us to the truth and the hope of God while we face these struggles. So reach out, open up, seek out brothers and sisters who can fight alongside you in the midst of this life. And then conversely, be the ones who struggle for others' sake in prayer. Be faithful. Go to battle on their behalf. Ephesians 6 Paul writes about the whole armor of God that you must put on that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. What we each face in this life, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That would be much easier. We face off against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That is what we are up against. It is far bigger than anything else. That is what your brother or your sister is facing each and every day, is the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This battle is far greater than we can comprehend. And yet, we have the chance to be praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. May we be always making supplication for our brothers and sisters in Christ. May we constantly, regularly, always be going before God for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us fight alongside them. Let us pick them up when they are weak. Let us build them up in the areas, in the gaps in their lives. Let us help point them back to Christ. Let us be those faithful brothers standing side by side with them as we all seek Christ. And I want to see just real quick kind of the content of Paul's prayer request. And really, We've seen this throughout Paul's prayers for the churches, that there are some temporal concerns in them, but even those temporal concerns, I mean, Paul is praying for his safety on this mission. He's asking for deliverance from the unbelievers in Judea, and then he's asking that his work would be good, his work would be accepted, that his service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. That in the difficulty and challenges of this ministry, of going to the middle of Jerusalem, where he hasn't exactly had the greatest of times in the past in ministry, and spoiler alert, it goes even worse this time, but he is asking ultimately that he would be protected as he shares this blessing with the church there, and that the blessing, the ministry, the service that he offers would be received well. And so his focus there is really on the ministry that while he's asking for these temporal things, he's asking for protection. He's asking for deliverance, for rescue, from protection from those who would persecute him. He's asking for that for the sake of ministry, so that he might continue to do what God has laid on his heart to do for the sake of the kingdom. Because his desire is ultimately that, let me go and do what I've committed. Let me serve the church in Jerusalem by blessing them financially with this offering that I have gathered so that then I may continue on in my ministry. His desire is to go to Rome, but really Rome is not the end. He's seeking to ultimately go to Spain, that he wants to go. I hope to see you, he says in Romans 15, 24, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped in my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. His desire is to go to Spain to plant churches there. That ultimately his desire is to expand the church to the westernmost area of the Roman Empire at the time. And so he asks for protection. And so we want to see that our requests 
are under these banners, under these ideas, with this focus on glorifying Christ, on serving Christ, on seeking Christ in Him. And so we want to see sanctification and ministry being at the heart of what we are praying for, of what we are asking for prayer for. We've seen that in the prayers that we have studied of Paul for the churches. Philippians 1, 9 through 11, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. There in Philippians 1, Paul is praying for the sanctification of the believers in the church at Philippi, that they would know the will of God, they would have be filled with this knowledge and discernment so that they would be filled with the fruit of righteousness, that he is asking and praying for them to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Or in Colossians 1, 9 through 14, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Paul's prayers are guided by his desire for them to be sanctified and for the desire of serving Christ. And so we want to have our prayers guided and informed by those two ideas of ministry, of service to Christ. And that may look like an official post serving in kids ministry or in youth or in some specific role in the church. I hope that each of you, as you grow in Christ and as you grow in your relationships here at Compass, find a place to serve. But I think that is a wonderful blessing and act that you can offer to the church to use your talents, your gifts that God has given you for the sake of blessing His church. That you can find and do that through official, specific roles in the different ministries based on where you're gifted, what you are equipped to do. But we also ought to be doing that in serving one another. That struggling for the sake of your brothers and sisters in Christ is part of your ministry and service to the church. That's one of the the things that we need the most in our churches, in our ministry, is continued growth and sanctification, that we would each be continuing to grow more like Jesus Christ in our lives. And one of the greatest ways we will see that happen is when we are praying for each other, and not in just a mere general sense, but when we know and are invested in the lives of one another, able to pray specifically for the needs and the struggles that we each have so that we are contending alongside one another for the sake of Christ. There are no lone rangers in the Christian faith, in the Christian life. I mean, the Apostle Paul gets a ton of headlines in Scripture for good reasons. He writes the largest number of uh, books that are in the New Testament. He founds churches all the way across the Roman Empire. He does so much for the sake of Christ. And yet, let us look beyond just that public ministry of Paul. And even in the public ministry of Paul, it's constantly Paul and Silas, Paul and Timothy, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Luke, the physician, the one who wrote Luke and Acts. These men are going alongside each other to do this ministry, that Paul is never alone in his public ministry, but is constantly serving alongside others. And at the same time, Paul is constantly asking for prayer from these churches that he is ministering to. I mean, we've seen it in our passage for tonight. We saw it in 2 Corinthians 1.11, Philippians 1.19, For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Philemon 22, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. In Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, after we are making supplication for all the saints and also for me, for Paul, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. If the Apostle Paul needed prayer to proclaim boldly the message of the gospel, you need prayer to proclaim boldly the message of the gospel. I need prayer to proclaim boldly the message of the gospel. 
There are so many more. Colossians 4, 3, 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Paul is constantly seeking prayer from other believers for the sake of his ministry. It is so essential that we be offering prayer on behalf of others and that we be seeking prayer from others for our own sake, that we would be building each other up by our prayers for one another. There's the classic story. The reason why we call our prayer ministry here at Compass the Boiler Room is from the old story of C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon's church in England. And he had a few college students come to his church and some guy came and saw them and was like, oh, let me give you a tour. Let me take you down to the boiler room. And they're like, "Uh, that's weird, but okay. Uh, You're being generous to show us your church before church starts. That's that's nice. And he goes and he opens the door to the boiler room and it is a room filled with 100 plus people praying. And he said, this is the boiler room. This is the engine room. This is the room that makes all of our ministry happen. The story goes that it is Spurgeon himself who is giving these young college students a tour of the church. That what his ministry was founded upon, the strength of his ministry for the sake of the gospel, was not in his charisma, his talents, his abilities, but was in the power of prayer, was in all of these people committed to praying each and every time his church gathered for the sake of the gospel. That that is what ultimately powers these things. Let us truly be convinced and convicted that prayer works, and therefore let us struggle on behalf of others in prayer. That ultimately, if we want to see anything accomplished in our lives for the sake of Christ and the gospel, it is going to be done, it's going to be founded upon and undergirded by prayer. Things that last are things that are founded and undergirded and strengthened by and covered with prayer. But I also want to look, I chose the wording of this title, The Struggle of Prayer, uh, because I think that word struggle can have a couple of different meanings, and I want to look at the second idea of it here, because we see Paul's requests. Paul asks, Pray that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Those are the two things that he is requesting there in verse 31. So let's see how that turned out. Again, this is following along Paul's own prayers. He says in Romans 1, 8 through 12, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the... Yes, who I... Serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. His desire is that he would be able to visit the church at Rome. And then as we saw earlier in Romans 15, 24, that his desire is to visit the church at Rome, to be encouraged by them, to encourage them, to build them up, and then to go off on into Spain and to plant churches there. That that is the reason, his desire, his hope. But that's not how this story ends. And in fact, Paul does go to Jerusalem to bring this ministry to the saints in Jerusalem, but it does not turn out for his deliverance from the unbelievers, but he has ended up being delivered over to the unbelievers. And Paul des- desires to go to Jerusalem and then go on to Rome and then further on into Spain, but Acts 21 verses 30 to 36 Paul is in Jerusalem, and then all the city, all of Jerusalem, was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another, and as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! 
that doesn't exactly seem like God answered his prayer for deliverance from the unbelievers in Judea. In fact, it seems like God didn't answer that prayer. And so let us learn from Paul's example and learn from his requests here to keep praying when, even when prayers go unanswered. That not only do we need to struggle alongside others in prayer, but we need to overcome the struggle of prayer when they go unanswered. That we need to keep praying even when prayers go unanswered. We understand when prayers don't go unanswered because they are selfish and sinful. When we're able to look at it and go, yeah, that was a really dumb thing to pray for. I didn't need to get a Ferrari. That would have been a poor thing for me to get. That was selfish. That was sinful. We understand when God says no to those things. And yet Paul's desire is to go to Rome, to be encouraged by the Christians there, and then to go to Spain where the gospel had not yet been preached, and to go there and to preach the gospel and to start churches and to disciple new believers in Spain. That seems like a wonderful thing to seek and desire and to go after. And that is something Paul had been regularly doing throughout his life, is going places where the gospel had not yet been preached, to preach the gospel, to plant churches, to establish believers in those regions. This is a good and godly thing. It's according to the character and nature of God to go preach the gospel where it has not yet been preached. And yet, his desire that he would be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, it, it really doesn't seem to come out that way. That while the Roman Christians and while Paul himself are contending alongside each other for Paul's protection. He is arrested and barely kept alive in the midst of this riot. I mean, certainly we can say he was delivered from them in that they didn't kill him on the steps of the temple, that he was rescued from death there. But his desire to go to Spain, God said no. We have no record, no evidence whatsoever that at any point in time in the life of Paul, he ever made it to Spain. There's no evidence. We can most likely conclude that God said no to Paul's desire to go plant churches in Spain. And while God certainly answered the deliverance prayer, he definitely answered it in a way that is not what Paul was intending when he was making that request. Paul was de desiring to go in and to not be bothered, to not be bound in any way by these unbelievers in Judea so that he could go and encourage the church and then head on the long journey from Jerusalem to Rome. And he certainly did make the long journey to Rome. It just was a very circuitous roundabout with many other steps journey from Jerusalem to Rome, filled with beatings and imprisonment and shipwrecks, and snake bites, and many other things. And yet, Paul did arrive in Rome. That Paul did eventually make it to Rome. And, as Paul had said, right in the verse before our passage for tonight, Paul writes in Romans 15, 29, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I don't know if Paul really grasped exactly what that would look like when he made this statement as he wrote this. But Paul does come to Rome in the full bless fullness of the blessing of Christ. I mean, that is so crystal clear as we read the letters that Paul wrote from this imprisonment. The letter to the Colossians, the letter to the Philippians, the letter to the Ephesians, the letter to Philemon. These four letters were all written during Paul's imprisonment in Rome. These are letters that are dripping with joy, with gladness, with trust in God, with hope and faith and security in God. Paul did not anticipate how this journey to Rome would come about, and yet 
he arrives in Rome full of the blessing of Christ, and there, for two plus years, he is able to spend time with these Roman believers, filled with joy, being refreshed in their company. And Acts 28, Acts, the book of Acts ends with this statement. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That Paul had the opportunity to preach the gospel in Rome. That in fact, Paul writes in Philippians that the entirety of the Praetorian Guard, the men who guarded Caesar's life, knew that his imprisonment was for the sake of Christ. The men who were charged with keeping Caesar alive knew the gospel because of Paul being there in Rome. Paul had wonderful opportunities for the gospel because God, in his good plan, did not answer Paul's prayer as Paul intended. And so, we need to face this struggle of prayer when prayers go unanswered. We need to do it by trusting in God. And we need to do it by trusting in the providence of God. It has been said, I think it's John Piper, but I could be wrong, that providence is sovereignty with purpose. That God is sovereign. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is in control over all that is happening in the world. But His sovereignty has a purpose. That purpose is ultimately the glory of God. But for those who are in Christ Jesus, the glory of God is our good. That we get to enjoy the goodness of God for His glory. We read in Proverbs 16, 9, that the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Or Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Proverbs 21, 1, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. We need to trust in the good plan of God. Trust in the providence of God, that he is sovereign over all things. And that ultimately his plan will be accomplished. And that his plan is the best. As Shannon Hurley, our missionary in Uganda, says, there is a king and his way is best. And not only is that true in the way we ought to live our lives, but that is true in the way the entirety of the world is orchestrated. That we can trust that as we look out in the midst of a world that seems to have lost its mind and run after those cosmic powers of dark of this present darkness that has committed its ways to the spiritual powers of darkness in the heavenly realms that though the world seems to have gone off the edge pursuing sin that god is in control that god is sovereign over all of that and if we can trust that in the midst of the chaos of this world god is sovereign and orchestrating everything for his glory, and the good of those who are called according to His purpose, then when God does not answer our prayers as we desire them to be answered, we can trust that God has a better plan than what the answering of that prayer would have meant. Let us trust in the providence of God. And again, we can trust in the providence of God because we can trust in the character of God. That God has sovereignty, His sovereignty has a purpose shown through His providence, but we can trust who God is. That not only is He the omnipotent, almighty, sovereign God over all creation that He created by the power of His Word, but He is good. That is something we need to cling to. Luke 18, we looked at this passage when we were on retreat. Luke 18, 1 through 8, it's the parable of the persistent widow. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Praise God for His uh, giving to us the purpose of parables at times. It really makes it easy to understand what's going on. 
He said, In a certain city there was a judge, who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, This man is, understands himself at a very deep level, but doesn't make any changes. Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Here we have an argument from the lesser to the greater, from the far lesser. We have an unrighteous, unjust, earthly judge. And if he is willing to give justice if he is willing to give justice to this widow because she is persistent and annoys him, how much more likely is God to give us good things if we persistently seek him and ask him? God, the just, righteous, heavenly Father. So let us never grow tired of seeking him, of crying out to him, because he is good. He is our good Father in heaven. That we want to persist in prayer when He says no, because His plans are better than ours. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let us trust in the good providential Lord, that though he may not answer our prayers as we desire, or he may answer them no, let us continue to persist in prayer, whether that be continuing to ask him for these good things, trusting that in his good timing he will give them, or whether that being to continuing to pray to God always with variety of requests and cares and concerns because we know that he is good. He delights in giving good gifts to his children. And so let us seek him in prayer. And Paul ends this passage with, May the God of peace be with you all. And so let us trust in the God who grants peace. That though we do not understand why things are the way that they are, we do not necessarily understand the plans of God, for we cannot possibly comprehend the mind of the Lord. We have God and His Word and His will revealed to us through Scripture so that we can know Him, so that we can seek Him, so that we can trust in Him. And so... May he be the one to whom we constantly go in prayer, this good, sovereign Lord who is providentially orchestrating all things for good. Let us go to him in prayer. Let us struggle for the sake of others and for ourselves before God for the sake of his glory. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There is light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. May we constantly be going before God with our cares, our concerns, our troubles, our difficulties. May we look full in his wonderful face and find the peace of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, that surpasses all understanding, trusting in him, finding rest in him, because he is orchestrating all things for our good and for his glory. Let us rest in that. Let us pray to him, because we know he is good. And let us pray now. God, we thank you that you hear us when, you, when we pray. And God, we thank you that though you do not answer all of our prayers as we desire, God, we thank you that you don't because we know that your plans are better. And yet, God, you delight in answering our prayers. You have asked us to pray to you, 
and have committed yourself to answering the prayers of your people. God, what a wonderful thing it is that we can go before you with our requests, with our concerns, with our needs. God, with the requests, concerns, needs, cares of our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can struggle on their behalf before your throne. Thank you, Lord, that we have such a wonderful opportunity that though we may be physically alone as we are battling temptation, God, we never have to be alone in prayer, that we can share our requests with others, that we can bring those requests to others and we can ask and urge and exhort and appeal to them to ask you to seek your face, to struggle alongside of us before you on our behalf. So God, we thank you that you have called us into the family of God, that you have brought us into the church. And that part of that means that we get to bear one another's burdens that we get to bear one another's burdens before the Lord uh, Most High, the Lord of all creation, and that you, Lord, are a God who delights in answering prayer. So God, may we persist in struggling on behalf of others in prayer. May we persist when prayer seems to be a struggle because you are not answering our prayers as we desire. But may we trust in your providential plan and in the goodness of you, Lord, knowing that your plan is perfect. So may we trust in you, delight in you, and rest in you. We ask these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen.